Watch this. Our lieutenant governor is speaking out once again about her appearance last month at an alt-right, white nationalist organized conference. And it doesn't seem to match what she told us. Are you familiar with who puts this event on? Like Nick Fuentes? I don't, I don't know who he is. I don't, I've never met him. I don't know who he is. It's been a busy week at the Idaho State House, but if there's a bright spot, well, they might be almost finished, which means last year's record for longest session is safe. This small, quaint North Idaho town at the base of the Bitterroot Mountains has quite the history, especially the story of how it got its name. It's been more than two weeks since we spoke with Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan outside her state house office about her appearance at AFPAC last month. To be associated with people who are anti-Semitic. Or... Stop, stop. Yeah. Excuse me, excuse me. That's the one, yeah. Well, this week, that interview was taken to a whole nother level, forcing us to address it once again, because apparently our lieutenant governor wasn't exactly being completely truthful with us two weeks ago. First, some background. AFPAC stands for America First Political Action Conference and calls itself the alternative to CPAC, which is the Conservative Political Action, <clears throat> excuse me, Political Action Conference. That's held the same weekend and in the same city, usually, for the last three years. As we mentioned before, Alternative is an appropriate adjective since many consider AFPAC to be a conference for the alt-right. After all, it is organized, headlined, and attended by white nationalists and anti-Semites. For example, Nick Fuentes, who we just mentioned, who started AFPAC, took part in the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville and the January 6th insurrection at the U.S. Capitol, and he said all kinds of things that fall under white nationalist, anti-Semite. He's a known white nationalist, anti-Semite, and a Holocaust denier. So here's a quick timeline of how this all played out. The lieutenant governor was invited to speak, but in her words, regrettably couldn't due to her commitments with the Idaho Senate. So she sent a six minute video instead to AFPAC. It was played on Friday night, February 25th. On Saturday, word about our lieutenant governor's appearance at the white nationalist conference had made its way back to Idaho with several organizations and political leaders calling for her to resign because of it. She doubled down though, responding with not a chance. On Monday, we waited outside her office to ask her about it, which we did. The rest of that week was filled with Idaho's Republican Party, Governor Little, and the Wozniak Center for Human Rights denouncing anyone's affiliation with such groups. We even spoke with Boise's Rabbi Dan Fink that Thursday, who told us McGeehan actually asked him about being part of an anti-Semitic task force, if there ever was one, which Rep Rabbi Fink said he found, quote, laughable, considering her past policies and affiliations, on top of, well, this latest one. Then this week, our interview outside her office gained new traction when it was posted on Twitter by a reporter working on a story for The Guardian, which brings us to what was put out into the zeitgeist yesterday. Lieutenant Governor McGeehan sat down for an interview with Jack Hadfield, the associate editor of Valiant News, a right-wing website which touts itself as being on the forefront of, quote, the 2016 counterculture led by President Donald Trump. About eight minutes into the interview, Hadfield said this. You spoke recently at a conference at AFPAC uh, in Florida where there are a lot of energized young conservatives who you know, supported America First policies. Um, I was wondering if you could expand a little more on, on, the, uh, on, on, on the vitriol that you received for daring to speak to, uh, to young people who love America. Considering white nationalists and anti-Semites being labeled as young people who love America is interesting in and of itself, which seems like a good time to tell you about Jack Hadfield. According to Muckrack, which is a website that compiles portfolios for journalists, Hadfield is a freelance reporter who covers free speech, censorship, and big tech. His byline has appeared on such websites as National File, New Right Network, Infowars, Breitbart. You can see where this is going. He was also outed as one of the administrators of a secret group on Facebook that frequently allows racist posts and alt-right content. Just to put that young people who love America in perspective. But before we hear Lieutenant Governor's answer, I think we should hear what she told us two weeks ago when we asked her if she knew what she was getting into by agreeing to appear at this conference. And if she did, why go ahead with it? Are you familiar with who puts this event on? Like Nick Fuentes? I don't, I don't know who he is. I don't, I've never met him. 
I don't know who he is. Did you not look into it before you decided to say okay? Like to find out, I mean, his name is on it. Well, you know what? Nick Fuentes, I don't, as I said, I don't know him. I don't, he, he's never, I've never met him. I don't know, you know, what, what is, what he's, everything that he says or doesn't say is not, uh, does not reflect on who I am or who the thousands of others that are participating in this movement. Okay. You didn't bother to look up his name or anything? I like didn't that. say that. You, you did look him up? You, you didn't, that's not the question that you asked me. Did you look up who Nick Fuentes was and what, he, he, what he's talked about? Like what he, things he has said? I have since. Since last week, not before? Yes. Okay, did you, did you catch that? She didn't look into who Nick Fuentes was or what he has said or what he stands for before agreeing to appear at the AFPAC conference. That's what she said. But here's what she told Mr. Hadfield yesterday. Um, I was wondering if you could expand a little more on on the uh, on, on on the vitriol that you receive for daring to speak to uh, to young people who love America. On the cancel culture of the mm -hmm. illiberal left, is that what you're talking about? Yes. Absolutely. I was invited to present a video of of my commitment to the Idaho First policies and my vision for the state of Idaho and for America to these to thousands of young conservatives. I was invited by Michelle Malkin. <laughs> and so yes, I did know who I was talking to, who I was who had invited me to speak at that conference. So she did know who she was talking to and who invited her to speak at that conference, which is quite a different thing than what she told us two weeks ago. She went on to add and imply, how can she be courting white nationalists, anti-Semites after all, since she was invited by Michelle Malkin, whose family is from the Philippines and whose husband is Jewish. Is that the same as asking, how can I be racist? My cousin married a black person, I ask. And if you want to know more about Michelle Malkin, just check out her Twitter feed and you'll find out a lot about her. I asked Lieutenant Governor McGeehan today if she would clarify her difference in answers. She said, nothing has changed. I was speaking to a group of young America First conservatives and was invited by Michelle Malkin. The Malkin part, of course, she left out of our previous conversation. But would it have mattered? Like if your friend invites you to a dog fight where they're gonna be serving pizza and you love pizza, do you go to that dog fight? So it appears Lieutenant Governor, she, she's double, triple, quadrupled down on being okay with appearing at an event organized by white nationalists. All right, we could be heading into the final week of the legislative session if we can believe the intentions of some of our lawmakers, which will likely mean we're about to see a flurry of bills needing or waiting or hoping for the governor's signature, like the one today sent by the Senate, which would increase the secrecy surrounding where Idaho officials get their execution drugs. Companies that manufacture those drugs would be granted anonymity by the state. And right now, lethal injection is the only legal form of execution available to those on death row. The bill originally failed to make it out of a Senate committee on a tie vote, but was later revisited because a member was absent. Well, that tie was broken, and today the Senate passed it 21-14. The floor debate centered around how granting confidentiality to drug companies would be the only way for the state to carry out these, ex these executions, the only way they would agree to send us these drugs. But those against the executions, or say that the executions require such transparency, believing the bill would be challenged in court. The last time Idaho executed an inmate on death row was back in 2012. As of today, there are eight inmates on Idaho's death row. County clerks will have access to another way to make voting more accessible. A bill that would ban absentee ballot drop boxes has died in the Senate. The bill, which narrowly passed the House last week, it's been sitting in the Senate State Affairs Committee since then, waiting for a hearing. Well, this morning, Committee Chairwoman Senator Patty Ann Lodge said it will not get a hearing, effectively killing the bill for the year. Lodge says she received thousands of emails asking her not to take up the bill. The bill's sponsor, Representative Priscilla Giddings, has said previously there's a bigger benefit to not having these ballot boxes, as she believes they're susceptible to theft and other issues that could lead to voter fraud. But county clerks from across the state argued, well, that's just not happening. They've never encountered a problem like that. They say, also say this would have hurt rural voter, voters if this went into effect. Uh, they would have to drive hours possibly to drop off their ballots.
All right, so it's Friday, which is a good time for the 208 callback. We're going to call this one the legislative edition. This week, there was a lot of movement down at the state house, as you just heard, including several controversial bills. And let's start with what we saw on Monday. Abortion is not a constitutional right. No one's most intimate medical decisions should be controlled by us. On Monday, one of the most restrictive abortion laws in the country was sent to Governor Little's desk for his signature. It's modeled after one recently passed in Texas, Senate Bill 1309. If it was signed into law or would be signed into law, it would make abortions illegal after six weeks. But it would also allow immediate family members to sue the doctor who performed the abortion. During the debate, we also learned this. Reading through here, I understand that, that a, uh, someone who has committed a rape would not be able to uh, sue if an abortion were to take place. Would a family member of said rapist be able to sue? Would they have standing? If it is the uh, parents, siblings, aunts and uncles, grandparents, then yes. Uh, same question then uh, for incest as well? Down 21. Thank you, yes. So a rapist family could sue, and if that rape is a form of incest, they could also sue is included in that bill. It passed the House along party lines 5114. We just learned that bill didn't make it to the governor's desk until yesterday afternoon. We were thinking this whole time they had until today to sign it. Well, the clock didn't start ticking until yesterday afternoon. So he has five days from yesterday to either veto it, sign it, or just let it go and let it go into effect on its own. So a decision will be made by or on Wednesday, we assume, next week, and it will officially go into effect 30 days after it is signed or just let to go into, well, legislation or into law. In the law, in the days since, both Oregon and Washington have said they are preparing for a possible influx of Idahoans who may be needing an abortion and heading to those states to seek one. On Tuesday, the Senate Majority Caucus said they would not be advancing House Bill 675. That's the bill that would make it illegal for anyone under the age of 18 in Idaho to get gender confirmation surgery. It would also put a ban on puberty blockers and hormone treatments, things that are used to assist in a gender transition. It would also mean you couldn't go out of state to get those things done. It passed the House last week. Senate President Chuck Winder said he believed the odds were very low of that bill being brought up in the Senate, and it looks like he was right. In a statement, Senate GOP leadership said while they oppose any and all gender reassignment surgeries, they said, quote, HB 675 undermines parental rights and allows the government to interfere in parents' medical decision-making authority for their children. We believe in parents' rights. And the best decisions regarding medical treatment for options or medical treatment options for children should be made by the parents, they said, with the benefit of their physician's advice and expertise. Which is why that bill, now literally and figuratively in the drawer in a state affairs committee, will not see the light of day. Wednesday, we heard from Chuck Winder again on a different bill, one he introduced with two others called the COVID Pause Act. It would prevent most employers from requiring employees to get the vaccine for one year. It would also prevent businesses from discriminating against anybody who shows up, visitors or attendees of an event, who have chosen not to get the COVID vaccine. There are some exceptions, specifically for those working for the federal government, as well as those working for health care systems that receive Medicare or Medicaid. It would also not apply to employees that are required to travel out of state where vaccines are required. There are criminal penalties in the bill, including facing misdemeanor charges of a $1,000 fine. Try to recognize that there are legitimate business interests uh, that need to be protected, but there are also legitimate personal interests that need to be protected. I like to use the expression, thread the needle, on protecting the rights of the employee while trying to safeguard uh, the rights of the employer. Of course, those against the bill say that Idaho, which calls itself the least regulated state in the country, should stay out of businesses affairs altogether. This morning it was up on the House floor where it received only a positive debate and passed 45 to 23. It now heads to Governor Little's desk. And by the way, Idaho's COVID state of emergency, which has been in place for more than two years, will come to an end officially on April 15th. So the bill, were it to be signed into law, would expire on April 15th, 2023. State House leadership also signaled they hope to be done for the end of the year by next week. But with dozens of bills still left on the reading calendar, including budgets, who knows? We'll find out if they actually adjourn a week from today. Oh, and one other thing. An odd scene played out in the House for the second time in a week. Wait, I know what you're thinking. Something odd in the House? Well, you're going to have to be more specific. 
Well, this wasn't regarding COVID or abortion or CRT. No, it was just a basic resolution commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Sawtooth National Recreation Act. Here's a little background for you. Back in 1972, Idaho Senator Frank Church helped establish the 756,000 acre Sawtooth National Recreation Area and created the Sawtooth Wilderness Area. And that includes more than 300 high elevation lakes, more than 700 miles of hiking and trails, and it's absolutely beautiful. It's a popular spot for Idahoans and tourists alike, thanks to places like Redfish Lake and the White Cloud Range. Representative Ned Burns of Bellevue, who sponsored the bill, brought it up once, but then it failed because it included references to future wilderness areas in Idaho. So he went back to the drawing board, took out that line and reintroduced it. But several lawmakers still took issue with the fact that land is federal land. I just want to point out what this bill is and what it isn't. This is not a celebration of the wilderness of the state of Idaho. This is a celebration of the federal government's overreach and management of what should be state lands. I was going to say that this bill just makes fluffy statements about how how great uh, the government declaration is on this, but it's actually more serious than that. We are honoring federal control, federal management of lands. I'm just trying to uh, honor some hard workers and some beautiful land in our state. Um, that's about it. The expression on his face, like, I don't know what I just did, but okay, I, I don't know how this got here. A majority agreed, though, with that sentiment that this shouldn't be happening, and it failed on a 2245 vote. By the way, that same bill passed the Senate with a unanimous voice vote. I guess the beauty of the federal government, federally managed Sawtooth Recreation Area will go without a resolution. A North Idaho town founded by an ass, and it's not Athol. We can say that on TV, right? But come on, it's Friday, give us a break. We're gonna have to say it to tell this story. Is there another place in Idaho we need to know? Tell us about it. Text us at the number on your screen, 208-321-5614. While you're there, feel free to text over whatever's on your mind. Questions, comments, complaints about the show. Just make sure to include your name and the hashtag the 208. All right, as we've learned from getting or doing several of these get to know Idaho series, most of our cities and towns named after something or someone, maybe a geographical feature like the Tetons or a person like Lewis Merriweather, as in Lewiston, right? What about the town of Kellogg, about 30 minutes southeast of Coeur d'Alene at the base of the Silver Mountain? And if images of Snap, Crackle and Pop or even just Tony the Tiger slip into your mind, no one would blame you for that. I mean, it's called Kellogg for, you know. However, the town is not a nod to the cereal giant. It's not. But its beginning and local legacy is a tribute to a beast of burden, believe it or not, which is why this story comes with a bit of a warning. Just to let you know, as we get to know Idaho, we're about to say jackass, like a lot. The story goes, a man by the name of Noah Kellogg came to the area to prospect in 1885 with nothing more than flour, beans, bacon, and a traveling companion who carried it all. 
a jackass named Bill. Well, Bill wandered off one early September night, and it took weeks to find him. But they did, just two miles south in an area called Wardner, just grazing among a galena deposit, which is a fancy word for lead ore. Turns out, Bill was eating on what would eventually be established as the world-famous Bunker Hill Mine. It led to the city of Kellogg incorporating in 1907. And for nearly 100 years, that mine produced more than 28 million tons of lead, silver, and zinc. Then in 1981, the Bunker Hill Mine closed down, leaving thousands out of work and a slew of lead contamination. But Bill's legacy still lingers in the area too. In 1967, Jackass Ski Bowl, named in honor of Burrow Bill, opened nearby. Though it didn't last long. In 1973, Jackass Ski Bowl went bankrupt, it was later bought, and renamed Silverhorn. In 1990, it changed names again and is now known as Silver Mountain Resort. However, Kellogg has embraced its borough beginnings, its jackass genesis, if you will. The welcome sign still reads, this is the town founded by a jackass and inhabited by its descendants. Clever, Kellogg. Yep, the jackass mascot still lives on to this day. The area celebrates their unofficial mascot with the annual Jackass Half Marathon, as well as Jackass Ski Day at Silver Mountain, which is used to commemorate the resort's opening day in 1990. All right, quick reminder, the other March Madness going on tomorrow. College of Idaho Yotes back in action at the NAIA Men's National Championships in Kansas City. And the final eight teams remaining in the tournament. And tomorrow they're taking on number one Loyola at 10 a.m. And you can watch it live at the organization's website, NAIA.org. 
Jay and Will are going to have highlights for you in tomorrow's newscast, of course, but make sure to tune in and cheer on the Yodis. All right, final moments of the show before we get out of here on a Friday. Let's take a look at the comments and questions you sent in during today's show, like this one from William. If the Idaho legislature thinks taking the rights of parents out of their hands for hormone therapy is wrong, why not for abortions? Can't women make the call for their own body, he asks? It's a good question. I mean, if life begins at conception and if there is a heartbeat at six weeks and therefore it becomes a child, then aren't you officially then kind of a parent at that point? And then have, it's all part of that same equation, I guess. But it is, there are a lot of layers to these arguments and these debates. Oregon and Washington are friends of Idaho's intelligent women who choose to control their own bodies. Thank you to our Western neighboring states, says Larry from the 208, or to the 208. And this is because of their opening up and making it easier, though, for Idahoans, should this law be passed or signed into law, can go across the border to seek the uh, health care that they need. I never in my wildest dreams would have ever thought I would want to move from Idaho. Idaho legislators are so out of line on so many issues, says Ginny. Pierce, the person who inv invited Lieutenant Governor McGee and Michelle Malkin is known for her association with white nationalists and neo-Nazis. Sounds just as bad as the person she said she didn't know, said Sheila. The dogfight pizza party analogy was perfect, except that the lieutenant governor wants us to think she went to Florida for the pizza. Well, we all know, and so does she, that she went for the unconscionable violence, says Liz in Boise. We'll see you next week.